morning, church. We have some announcements today. Um, Scuba, our VBS, starts tomorrow and runs through Friday. So next, next Sunday should be the VBS Sunday. For support our troops, the June collection is coffee and one pounds or less, fruit snacks, and ink pens. Need some help restocking the shelves at the food pantry. It's non-perishable food items that aren't expired, and monetary donations are welcome. The June book night is June 19th at 6.30 p.m. New readers are welcome. Are there any other announcements? Tiffany? I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for this past week. I had so much help that I actually had to tell people, I don't have anything for you to do. So that was a really awesome problem to have. So thank you to everybody who came this week and helped prep for VBS. I appreciate you all. Are there any other announcements? Please stand, join with me in the call to worship. We come to this place and time of worship as individual worshipers. We come from north, south, east, and west. We come with diverse political and theological viewpoints. We come with our own unique perspectives on life and faith. May this oneness be reflected in our worship today and in our lives in the coming times. Amen. Next up, we have some music by Seventh Day. We know it's kind of hot for these songs, but we don't know. So if you happen to know one, feel free to sing, feel free to clap.
So if that would be appropriate, then I will someday should be the next song after the second set. Yeah.
Next, we have a video from the Grow Kids talking to their dads. I love my dad because he takes me hunting and fishing. I like to go to the softball field with my dad and practice bat. What I like to do with my dad is when he takes me out to baseball games. What I love doing with my dad is cooking. I like when my dad takes us hiking in the summer. What I like to do with my dad is I like to play softball, hunting, and fishing with him. I love my dad because because he gives me food and any and he gives me kisses and hugs. I love my dad because he takes me fishing. I love my dad because he makes us really good food. I like when my dad lets us ride his mini bike. Thank you, Dad, for always letting me go to Grandpa's to mow. I'm thankful for my dad because he makes really good brownies. What I love to do with my dad is playing sports and just having so much fun with him. What I like about my dad is he hunts and fishes with me. If the kids would come up for the children's sermon, please. Good morning, everybody. So I brought some items with me this morning, and I want to see if you can tell me what they are. So does anyone know what this first item is? Have you ever seen one of these before? Do you know what it is, Clara? I did not know what this was until Friday, but it's actually the same thing as this item. So do you know what this is? It's called, they're both called kaleidoscopes. So this one is Miss Dalsey's and it's glass. And she let me use this so that you guys could see. So if you want to take a peek, what you do is you look through that hole, but you want to hold on to this mirror too. So you guys can pass these around. And this was mine when I was a little girl. So how many of you have ever looked in a kaleidoscope before? They're really cool, aren't they? The, the design on the inside, you hold it up to the light and the image changes. So you just want to make sure you guys hold this part, okay, when you look through it and you look through here. The image will change when you're looking inside of it. And there could be an image that you think is really beautiful and you want to just keep it there forever, but you can't because if you turn the kaleidoscope ever so slightly, the image changes. So no matter how hard you try, you can't keep the same image. And that's just how it is with kaleidoscopes. The image inside is constantly changing. And you know, we live in a world that's like that, don't we? Our world is constantly changing. You guys are on summer break right now, and pretty soon in the fall, you're gonna be starting a new school year, which means you'll be in a new grade with a new teacher and new classmates. And we live in Pennsylvania, where we get to see all four seasons because the weather is always changing. So we get to experience fall and summer <clears throat> and spring and winter. And now, nothing ever seems to stay the same in our world. So in a world that's constantly changing, wouldn't it just be so awesome if there was just one thing that we could count on that always stayed the same when everything around us is changing? Well, guess what? What if I told you that the Bible tells us that there is something that never changes? The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that means when everything around us is changing and we don't know what to believe or think, we can always know that Jesus remains the same. And because Jesus remains the same, that means his love for us remains the same and that his truth remains the same. And that's one thing that we can count on. So when we spend time praying to him, 
and reading his word. He's going to help guide us in our walk with him. And you know, there's going to be times in our life where he's going to ask us to do things that require us to step out in faith. And it's not going to make any sense at all at the time. And we're going to wonder why he's asking us. And we're most definitely not going to get it right because we're sinful people and we make mistakes along the way. We'll make those mistakes. But isn't it such a comfort to know that Jesus is going to love us anyways because his love for us never changes. So Jesus is just so awesome, isn't he? So let's have a word of prayer, okay? Thank you, Jesus, for your love that never changes. And we're so thankful that we can count on you to remain the same in a world where everything around us is changing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Good morning, church. Happy Dad's Day to you. Let's take a moment and greet each other with the love of Christ. One of, the things, one of the things that always happens every year within our church is something called annual conference. It's a time where all the pastors and lay people get together and talk about the business of the church. And so Nancy Jo uh, Ralph went with me this year, and she was our lay delegate. We had a great time at conference, didn't we? Yeah, we sang together and um, great worship and, and some other things. But she is going to give us our conference report. Nancy? My iPad queued up. <laughs> there we go. First of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to go to annual conference and represent you there. I had a fabulous time. I really did. Um, I enjoyed the sessions, and I learned a lot. Um, to me, it was a a great experience. I I met a lot of new people. But I also met a lot of people that I knew from before for diff in different ways. A lot of people that I had associated with that I didn't know would be there. Several former students, which surprised me. <laughs> um, a couple were there as pastors, and a couple were there as just 
lay leaders. One was there as a pastor's wife. But it was just nice to make connections again. And also um, several people that were pastors that I had just come across in general as either working through our church or through other churches that I have been to. So thank you for the opportunity to represent you. In general, the groups met at various times. We had laity in one session on the first morning, and the clergy met in their own session. In our session, the laity session, we met with Paul Huey, who is the district lay leader. And he basically laid out what we could expect through the conference. He gave us an overview of what would happen. And then he also gave us the three major conference goals that had been set up for the year. The first goal was what they called the stewardship connection. And the goal there is to help the local churches and the conference in general to get people involved and to help the churches raise their stewardship connections by 10%. This is to get everybody more involved over the course of the 2024 year. And they're hoping to raise more money for all of us. As you know, we lost 25% of our membership through disaffiliation over the past two years. So we are trying to raise the funds back so that we have enough money to pay our pastors, help with church maintenance in general, pay for pensions, insurance, all the general stuff that goes into maintaining churches, in general, and our mission and our missionaries and our mission, our ministry in, connect, in general. The second connection was discipleship and helping the churches to build more disciples within our church. And this was aimed at deepening both the conference relationship with God and also helping the local churches to enhance their lay leadership and encourage more church participation in both the annual conferences and within their own churches in general. The goal is to raise participation by the general membership by 5% over the course of this next year. And the final was the congregational connection. And this was simply aimed at getting a more unified United Methodist Church. The goal there is to get us to come together, to work together, and to rebuild trust and love and communication within United Methodist Church and to promote the love of Jesus Christ through everything. Later that day, and from all sessions there on, we met together with the clergy, and we talked about all the business items that were brought up. We had a session early, early in the afternoon that day where the whole, congreg the whole congregate, the whole group of us were divided into three sections where we discussed business items. Each group was divided by laity and clergy with an equal number in each group. Um, part of us talked about the budget. Some of them talked about pension and general funds. And the other group talked about evangelism, missionaries, camps, and just spreading the word through that area. Okay. Then all these items were brought to the floor and discussed. Out of all these items, only one, only one caused a lot of debate, and that was the item on the three households. This was an item that had been tabled from the last year, and I believe you received a handout when you came in. If anyone did not receive a handout, if you would raise your hand, and we'll get you a handout. Did anyone not receive a handout? Okay, good. 
I would just basically like to highlight the three households and explain them to you just a little bit so that you understand them. Because our church, our church congregation, needs to make a decision on these three households. It is important that you understand them and that once you read them through, think about them, pray about them, and decide how you are feeling about them, that you contact somebody on the ad board. You can contact Lynn Schilling. You can contact myself, Joe Albert. Um, Mike Nadget is on that committee. Um, there are several. Of, if you're on the ad board, please raise your hand so that people can see you. Kathy, Bev, Tiffany, Dawn, please contact any of us, June, okay, and let us know how you are feeling before July 9th so that we can take your views to this group and then come up with a consensus of how your group is feeling. We need to do this by July 9th so that we can work in consultation with Pastor Jeff St. Clair. Okay? You will notice as you're reading through, a final decision has to be made and sent to the conference before the end of this year. If not, we will all be put into what's called the blended household. Let's look at the three households, shall we? The traditional. The traditional affirms that all members of all households, anyone, are treated with love and respect. Clergy in this group will not be performing same-sex marriages, and everyone in this group believes that marriage is the traditional between one woman and one man. Clergy, if single, are to remain celibate. If married, will remain monogamous. This group believes in the true God, the Trinity, with each being separate and distinct, yet one. They believe in the traditional scripture interpretation of marriage and human sexuality. Household belief in faith is salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and occurs when one believes, repents, confesses, and turns their life over to God. Salvation occurs through faith and a life of righteousness, holiness, and the witness of spirit are evidence of that salvation. <clears throat> Members then are to go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Members of this household believe in the Old and New Testaments, and they believe that these are the word of God to man. The scriptures are the authority and superior to all experiences, to all traditions and reason, no matter what, God's word is superior to everything. The aspirational perspectives, in other words, what we should be leaning for, is the belief of marriage between one man and one woman. No same-sex marriages in the church or on the church property. We confirm that all candidates for deacons or elders will live a life of holiness. 
and provide evidence of God's grace through their life and that they follow the scripture and that all are accountable to the book of the discipline. While everyone is allowed to come and worship with us and encouraged to come and worship with us, LGBTQIA plus will not be or cannot serve in leadership roles. That is the view of the traditional household, which primarily is what we are now. The blended household affirms and recognizes all people as the beloved children of God and appreciates the differences in people while each find their own center in Jesus Christ. They believe in diversity in the scripture interpretations and practice strength and encourage thoughtful discussions as people grow in discipleship and engage in ministry together. It includes those with a centrist perspective Perspective, those with different voices, and those congregants who do not wish to accept a household affiliation. Clergy may or may not choose to perform same-sex marriages. That would be between the clergy and the trustees of the church, which within which they are serving. Their considerations are to focus to love one another as Jesus commands, to show the work of the Holy Spirit within an individual's life, that the grace of God is for all people. The views of working together as critical for the ministerial and the mission of each person. They see people as bridge builders and want local churches and clergy to have the same local autonomy in order to be faithful to spirit-led understandings of their faith. It encourages a shared ministry through mutual respect, listening, and a focus on the mission. Their aspirational perspectives, they recognize all legal marriage, and if the church agrees, clergy may perform same-sex weddings. They will not disqualify anyone from ordination based on gender identity or sexual orientation. All are welcome. All may serve in leadership roles. That is the blended household. The progressive and this is the one that has the most changes. The progressive household celebrates and fully welcomes all God's people regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, social economic status, age, or physical ability. It includes LGBTQIA+, as for ordination, marriage, clergy positions, and all other church leadership ministry, whether it be at the local level, the district level, or the conference level. Members of this household are committed to advocacy for social justice with the LGBTQIA plus 
individuals. Their practice of faith is based on God's inclusiveness of love and grace for the renewal of all creation demonstrated through acts of prayer, worship, Bible study, discipleship, service, and advocacy with the poor and the oppressed. They operate under the belief that diversity is to be embraced. Discrimination is to be dismantled by both the church and society by living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. They believe that all households should see all people as children of God, worthy of love, respect, and thus equipping everyone to live together for the mission of the church and the outreach of all. Their aspirational perspectives is that the clergy and the congregation maintain, maintain oversight of all wedding process in accordance with their rules and their ethics. And it is not based on the sexual orientation of any couple. They will work to allow LGBTQIA plus persons to pursue God's call to ordination within the United Methodist Church. They believe that all qualified persons may serve in any and all leadership roles within the church, within the church regardless of their church orientation. As I stated before, all churches must decide a household alignment before December 31st of this year or they will be assigned to the blended household. Their choice must be reported to the annual conference on the summer form. Conference secretaries will keep track of which household we choose. And this will be considered when assigning pastors now, pastors may also choose which household they want, independently of what a church wants. And this will be put on their forms so that when it comes time for their placement, this will also be considered when they are placing or being placed. The bishop has stated no church will be compelled to accept somebody outside of their household. They can draw pastors and place pastors from outside the conference if they need to find somebody to fill a particular spot. In other words, if we were to ask for, say, a progressive pastor, and there were none, they can go to a different conference to find a progressive pastor to fill our pulpit. The same is true if we wanted a traditional pastor, and they did not have a traditional they can go outside of our conference to find a traditional pastor to help fill, fulfill our congregation, our pulpit. Everybody understands that? That is important, and she assured us that. Now, they have said that when, once we get to annual conference, everybody will be treated equally. All households will meet as a group within the conference as unity. 
but there will also be time set aside in the conference for all traditional churches to meet, all blended churches to meet, and all progressive churches to meet. There will also be activities set up with a team coming from conference to help all traditional churches, all blended churches, and all progressive churches with activities to help promote each individual household, to help get us together, to help focus, and to get us underway. They are saying that the benefits of joining a household gives the church a safe place to land, a safe place for pastors. It will also guarantee us a pastor if we join a household. It honors the contextual mission field of our church and the clergy. It will provide connections with others who believe the same as we do. It will foster unity while still remaining and recognizing our differences. The goal is to help rebuild trust and develop further connections. And like they said before, the household affiliations will be considered when assigning appointments. All households have the same core values. We all love God and will respect our neighbors. They all practice grace, respect, transparency, and openness. The attempt is to avoid bitter disputes within the church, within the community. The attempt is also to include laity and the clergy in every aspect of the process until churches are settled. And it's to help minimize chaos and disruption. Other than that, that was the big item that came out of conference this year. And it had been tabled from the 2023 conference, okay? Other than that, we had a great time at conference. Um, there was a conference choir. Both John, Pastor Jeff, and I sang in the choir, as did Heather Wakefield, who used to be a member here. So it, that was a lot of fun. On Thursday night, they recognized all the pastors. The pastors came in their robes and their stoles. So that was fun to see them all lined up. And they recognized pastors that were being transferred. They talked about the different pastors and where they were going. They recognized people who were being ordained that night, whether it was as a pastor or as a deacon or a deaconess or whatever. There were several of them. On Friday night, they recognized the retiring pastors and the retiring superintendents. And our own Dennis Swineford was recognized that night as he's retiring. He was recognized as having the most years of service, which was 43. And as a result, he gave the speech that night, the sermon, and it was very nice. He told about how he got involved and what his plans were it was very interesting. On Saturday, at the closing ceremony, when the choir sang, they also recognized, had a, as a memorial service, any of the pastors and laity who had been involved who had passed during the past year. It was at this service that our own Leo Kramer was recognized. And not only was Leo recognized, but they also recognized the scholarship that he and his family have established in his name to help 
beginning pastors with their educational fund. Um, like I said, I thoroughly enjoyed the conference. Um, if you have any questions on any of it, please see me afterwards. I will leave a typed copy in the office of my report, and I will answer any questions you want. I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of notes, not just the four pages that I had. But um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions you have at any time. You can call me, come see me, email me at schoolmarm inter at Zoom Internet. It doesn't matter. I'm available. So thank you. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we pray for our church. We pray for um, this time here, and we pray as we look at your word now that you would help us not to be distracted, um, that we could be focused on what you want for us today. Um, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture passages that we're looking at today is a rather short one. Um, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, one verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. It's the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So we have been talking about change. Uh, Tiffany talked a little bit about it in her children's moment. We talked about it a few weeks ago. We talked about transitioning to new things. And it is true, things have changed, as you've heard, for the people called Methodist. With its forming um, 240 years ago, with its vision of spreading the word for Jesus Christ. If you would go back and you lived in the, the turn of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s, you would have seen the Methodist church just booming all over the place. It started forming in this area in around 1826 with small groups in people's homes. And in 1829, three major religious groups got together and built a structure at a cost of $1,000. Three churches coming together, they called it the Three Faith Church. And it was said because of a revival that the Methodist movement, the Methodist church, had in this Three Faith Church, that they were deemed too rowdy, and they were not welcomed anymore. So the Methodists moved on, and they met upstairs in a distillery of all places <laughs> while they built their building. And in 1841, um, they had their building. A little before that, in 1839, uh, they organized the Sagertown Circuit. And a man named Bishop Matthew Simpson helped in the organization of this circuit. Um, Simpson would go on to do the, the eulogy at Abraham Lincoln's funeral. So an interesting thing for me is I came from Franklin Church before I came here, and on the rolls of Franklin Church, John Wilkes Booth is listed. He is the guy who assassinated Abraham Lincoln, and he went to church and lived in Franklin. If you go along the river, uh, there is like little like stops that you can see history of Franklin and there's one on John Wilkes Booth. And John Wilkes Booth attended in the church that I pastored at um, before I came here. So I went from the church where someone was involved that killed the president to someone where they eulogized the president. So I'm moving on up, I guess. Um, uh, the barn-like structure um, that housed the Methodist church survived over 100 years. They had good trustees back then, too. Um, and there was a, a fire that destroyed one of the original buildings, and the current building that we're now in was built um, in 1918 at a cost of $20,500. $20, now, you can't even really buy a car for that now. In 1924, one of the, the months offering was... Uh, $14.41. Can't 
can't even buy lunch at some places with that anymore for one person. The church has changed and have had some additions within the last uh, few like decades. And in 1990s was the last one where we see the sanctuary as it is today. Now, if you go to any trustee meeting, they are always working on something. Thank you, Don. If you, uh, he made an announcement last week uh, and showed all the things that they have done in the last six years since I've been here. And there's been a lot. One of the things that I'm grateful for, especially this week, is the air conditioning that is all throughout the week of the building now. Um, and this week is supposed to get up in the 90s with Vacation Bible School. That'll be very nice to have. Many pastors, and uh, one of the things that's happened too is leadership has changed as well. Many pastors and leaders coming and going throughout the years. If you've been here a while, you may have seen more than one pastor. Now, I came here six years ago, and today's my last Sunday here. Um, and on July 1st, Jeffrey St. Clair will be pastoring here. This is a, a wonderful slide up here that shows the whole history. You probably can't see it, but if, if you would want it in some way, uh, I'm sure we could print it out for you. It states all the pastors that have been here in the history of Sacred Town Church. Um, I'm, you know, things change. Things change in the church. The Methodist church practices what we call an itinerant system, meaning pastors and leaders get moved around a whole lot. And really the intention of that is so that the focus is never on the leader, but it should be on the thing that never changes. And we know that to be Jesus Christ. Hang around a Methodist church long enough and you'll see things change. I think in any church. Things change, right? But one thing we see in Scripture, according to our Scripture that we look today at today, is that Jesus Christ is the same today and yesterday and forever. The book of, Hebrew, uh, the book of Hebrews reminds us to think on the call and to remember your leaders. And this perhaps referred to former leaders who had passed away. The outcome of their life could be contemplated with good effect and the readers were to imitate their faith. Those leaders were gone. But Jesus Christ, of whom they spoke, remains consistently and continuously the same. Hallelujah. Leaders will change. Circumstances change. Um, and, and, and we need to be focused on uh, who Christ is. You know, if we look at the scripture, we see a cycle of belief, uh, a cycle that humanity is ca caught up in. And we can really find that in the book of Judges. The people worship God, um, and they were blessed. And, and then the people started worshiping other gods, and the culture comes in, and, and the people get in trouble, and they cry out to God. And God sends a deliverer, and then the people worship God and are blessed. And then the deliverer either dies or moves away. And the people start worshiping other gods and get in trouble. And then God sends a deliverer. And it continues on and on and on. And if we look at the history of the world, we can see that today too, that we can see that cycle continues. Sure, sure, circumstances change. But it would seem that we are caught in the cycle. And I always ask the question, why? Why doesn't our faith stay strong? Why doesn't the believers of God stay unwavering? Isn't Jesus the same today as he was yesterday and will be tomorrow? Well, I believe, this is my belief, that we have concentrated too much on the leaders or the politics and not enough on Jesus. Leaders come and go. Political agendas come and go. Good Christian authors that we might really connect with, they come and go. Yet Jesus, hallelujah, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is where we need to focus. We need to keep it more simple. And maybe if we all can agree on this simple fact, on this, the unchanging grace of Christ, maybe all the other things will, will fall into place. This is my, my prayer, and as we love Jesus with our whole heart, soul, and mind, 
we can learn to love our neighbor as ourselves. That things would be based on loving Christ and each other. You know, the first Sunday I was here, six years ago, I showed a video. And I want to show the same video on my last Sunday here. It is a video that, that moves me. It is a video that um, st- strikes my heart. It rings true for my vision of ministry. It's a powerful video for me, and I believe it is our mission. So take a look at this. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet, oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now, is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James, who was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. I believe that's what it's all about. Nothing special about these people. They're like you and I. Um, They're living into the love of Christ and the mission of making disciples and spreading the word. Not stuck on political bias. Not stuck on what interpretation of Scripture. Not stuck on whether we disaffiliate or who we welcome into our doors. It is about being true to the one who saved us, the true Adam, the one who has sacrificed for us, who loves us, who has risen for us, who transforms us. I believe we've gotten distracted from this. You know, I plan to, as I move on, to live into this mission. I pray that we will move forward with this in mind. And the, with the transforming of the Holy Spirit, um, I think we can do this. 
Yes, change is hard. Um, I, I, and, and, I, and denominations are going to do what they do. And I have to tell you, as a representative of this denomination, sometimes I feel helpless and embarrassed. Um, I confess that, as you might have, <coughs> have been, um, I have gotten distracted along the way, too. And I apologize for anything that I might have done to hurt the mission, that I may have uh, offended along the way. But folks, Jesus, Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday, and he's going to be this way tomorrow. Hallelujah. So let us now focus. Let us live into the mission of making disciples and continue forward. Let's pray this with all our hearts. Um, Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for the opportunity, the opportunity to, to live for Christ. And as we do that, Lord, help us to spread your word. Help us to know your word. Help us to be transformed by it. Help us to be transformed by our Savior. And let us love. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So as we take some time to to pray today, um, I I just really want to thank everybody for the farewell that we had last week, um, and it was my birthday. Um, I just felt very honored, and it's going to be a memory that I take with me and I will cherish. So thank you so much, congregation, for that. Um, Let's just move on with prayer today, um, if you'll pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together. We lift up our praises for who you are in our life. And Lord, as we we think about that, we confess that sometimes we become stuck. We become stuck in in different things um, that distract us from you. We call it sin. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness for that. But we thank you. We thank you that you are the same today, yesterday, and forever, that your resurrection shows that we will have eternal life. Your, your crucifixion saves us. You have sacrificed for us. And Lord, as we think about that, we, we just ask that it would continue to transform us. Lord, um, there are many people that we need to be lifting up today. Um, and continue to pray for Karen Omen as she um, recovers from surgery we pray for those that, that may be um, in uh, care facilities today. We think of Sam Harrison and Kent Perry. Um, Lord, we, we pray for those who have come home to the hospital, Bev Marvin, and, and for, for uh, um, her recovery. We continue to pray for Janet Williams and, and for, for Richard. Lord, I pray for this church, um, and I pray for Jeff as he comes here, for for Jeff St. Clair, and we just pray a blessing over that ministry. We pray a blessing over this church. Lord, I I want to specifically pray for Vacation Bible School this coming week, and we pray that lives would be transformed. Lord, we, we just pray this all in your most blessed name, and we thank you for the way that Jesus has taught us how to pray, and we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So as we continue our worship today, let me remind you that part of worshiping is giving. And as we take an offering today, uh, and Seventh Day plays for us, why don't we take some time to, to lift up and meditate and give thanks to God who has given us so much.
Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to give, and we ask that you would bless what is given today to be used to communicate your kingdom to our world, and that we would learn in the process. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's join together with our farewell liturgy. I thank you, the members and friends of Sagertown United Methodist Church. As I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned here. I accept your gratitude and forgiveness, and I forgive you, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. I release you from turning to me and depending on me, and I encourage your continuing ministry here, and I will pray for you and for your new pastor. Let's join together. (laughs) love us from everlasting to everlasting. We give you thanks for cherished memories and commend one another into your care as we move in new directions. Keep us one in your love forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen.
Thanks, Seventh Day, for being here today. Uh, May God continue to bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you all peace. Amen.
Thank you.